let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to your origin story. How did you get into genre and science fiction and fantasy? Oh, I, I grew up with it. My my mother was a real Tolkien aficionado. She was a scholar of English at Oxford University. She was a very, very big Tolkien fan. And my dad was really into the old school sci-fi and Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke and that kind of thing. So mm. I just grew up around it. And I remember my mum read The Hobbit. Well, it actually, when she started with Narnia, and I, I really, I, to this day, I detest Narnia. I really, <laughs> The first thing I ever had force read to me with every painful little Christian allegory explained in great detail because you want that when you're six and it's bedtime, don't you? It's just what you need. Yeah. So I didn't take to that. And, and then she gave up and threw her hands up in horror and moved on to The Hobbit. And I'm like, this is badass dwarfs fighting dragons. Now this, I can get behind this. <laughs> yeah. That was what I wanted. Very early, very early age SFF fan, definitely. Probably, I mean... I say more fantasy than science fiction, but I was a Star Wars original, 1977, four years old, in the cinema with mum and dad, mm -hmm. watching the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in the world. <laughs> you know, basically being obsessed with it for the next 10 years, as, as kids generally are, you know. So, yeah, always been a big part of life for me. It's, yeah. yeah, same for me. It's funny that you said it about the books and things. And I'm thinking about it. I think more of the sci-fi that I got into in early age was from film and TV. And mm. it, I got a bit older that I got more into the sci-fi books. I read, you know, The Hobbit and all the Narnia books and then all of the David Eddings kind of stuff. But it was a lot of fantasy. And then later uh -huh. on, it was like, oh, yeah, wait, there are actually sci-fi books I could read as well. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. I think I, I got into um, sort of Shannara when I was in middle school as well. That was quite a big thing at the time. And it was sort of kind of Lord of the Rings light. You know, you could, you could read it yourself without being confused by any of it. And it was just good fun, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It was, it was an early introduction as well. Yeah, all well, the Terry Brooks, yeah, Shannara books. Mm. It went on and on. He's done loads. He's done like... I think he's still doing them, actually. I'm sure there was one that came out last year. <laughs> I yeah, know. I think so. I think he did, like, the last one and kind of wrapped it wrapped it up. He's been doing oh, it for, for, yeah. for donkeys now, but, yeah. So who were some of your kind of early influences then and that want, you know, when you were thinking about writing and that kind of stuff, who was influencing you? It's going to sound weird because they're not fantasy authors, but yeah. Mickey Spillane and Mario Puzo. I've always loved my gangster stuff and the whole boiled noir. And... I, th I think I probably drew more from those guys than I did from most of the fantasy authors that I was reading. Mm. I mean, I think the, the first fantasy that I encountered that wasn't elves and dragons and sparkly things was Joe Abercrombie, but I was already writing by then. But yeah. I, I was writing Mike Hammer with a sword, do you know what I mean? I mean, they're terrible, but this is how you learn how to write, isn't it? You write terrible things until you get the hang of it. <laughs> But no, I, I definitely started in the noir crime roots, but just mixed it with fantasy, which is obviously my other main love at the time. So, yeah, a slightly unusual influence, I guess, for a fantasy author. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's just what you what you like, I guess, just what you're reading. So your 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 Drake books and the Burn Man <laughs> were they the first kind of books you were submitting, or did you have a number of trunk novels before those? Um, I, I wrote a trunk trilogy before the Drake books, which remains firmly in the trunk, probably where it belongs. I did submit that around a few agents, and I actually got all the way to a full request with. Jennifer Jackson at DMLA, which is now my current agency with a different agent. I can't imagine she remembers it, but that, that <laughs> was really all at the time. But uh, that was ultimately a no. And of course, I'd made the complete rookie mistake by then written the entire trilogy rather than starting something different while I was shopping book one. But um, yeah, after that, Drake was, was the next thing I wrote. And obviously that, that got published by Angry Robot. Yeah, because they remind me of, as you said, a lot of the uh, the crime novels that you mentioned, but they also remind me of um, like Mike Carey's uh, Caster books and mm, um, yeah. um, Tad Williams, Bobby Dollar, more recent stuff. I mean, were you into urban fantasy? Or was it just the crime thing? I, I was really into the Hellblazer comics. And there's yeah. there's a lot of Hellblazer went into Don Drake. I mean, I think anybody who's read the comics can, can see that. I can't deny it. <laughs> But yeah, I've, I've always loved that sort of thing. Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere I'm a huge fan of as well. Mm. And I like that sort of slightly out of time 
urban fantasy. I mean, they're they're set in the modern day, but it's still all a bit 70s in Don Drake's world. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of the Sweeney with demons sort of thing going on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, it's, it's funny because um, I've, I've read of quite a few kind of those urban fantasy books and it wasn't until it got into the darker side that I probably started enjoying it more. Some of it just was a bit too tame for me. Like mm. when a woman on the front with a sword with a, with a tramp stamp tattoo and I'd just be like, Oh, not another one of these, and I just roll my yeah, eyes. I've never read one of those. I must, I'll find the covers quite off pussy, I must admit. But I think that there's there's two distinct there's a distinction in genre, I think, between paranormal romance and urban fantasy. Yeah. I mean for for me, urban fantasy is the Drake, the Mike Carey kind of thing, Hellblazer, you know. And paranormal romance is a different thing, but they tend to get categorized together. And I think if you like one, you're probably not going to like the other. You know, if you want vampires and werewolves falling in love, you're not going to like my books. And if you like my books, you're not going <laughs> to like those books. So why they get categorised together, I don't really know. But I don't think it does either of us, you know, any of us on either side of the divide any favours, to be honest. No, they seem quite, yeah, very, very different. I think Mike Carey said the, uh, it almost seemed like the, um, the caster books were the Constantine stories that he wasn't allowed to write or... <laughs> You know, and he extended it and took it in new places, but um, it always felt to me like, yeah, this could have been like Constantine instead of yeah. Felix Castor. Yeah, he said, oh, I'll have to look those up. I'm not, I've, I've heard of him, obviously, but I've not read them, so I'll have to give those a look. He's done, I think he's done, I think there's four or, or five, and every time I see Mike, I bug him if he's going to write the last one, because there's one more to wrap it all up, and every time I see him, I'm like, Mike, I'm going to ask you that question again. <laughs> and he's like, Oh yeah, go on. Uh, so you can do the last caster book, and he's like, "Well, we were planning to do it, but then we did this, and then we did that, and then it's like, oh, he must love that. <laughs> he's all right with it. He's all right because then he, I think he did like Gil with all the gifts, and then it was a standalone. And it did really well, and then they're like, "Do us another one." So he's like, "Okay, now I'll do that instead." Yeah, well, that really did do well, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it made the made the film, and they made it round yeah. here as well, down the West Midlands. So oh, okay, cool. You know, like an abandoned. Um, hospital in Dudley or something. That's where they filmed part of it. Apparently. Glenn Close oh, wandering around Dudley. Oh, no. <laughs> It'd be mental. Yeah. Just, just Excellent. Just, I'd love it. I'd love it. So after you, so you've done this trilogy for Angry Robot and it's urban fantasy and stuff. And, and then, yeah. then you got War for the Rose Throne. Where, where did that come from? Well, the, the title or the idea no, of... The idea of how, you know... Yeah, the idea like, of it, it's, it's going back to what I said earlier. It's crime and gangster stuff is one of my favourite things. You know, I adore Godf uh, The Godfather and Goodfellas and Piggy Blinders and all that kind of thing. And obviously I like fantasy. And I just... I thought, what happens if I just ram the two together? Those are two of my favourite things. <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> So that's, that's what I did, and that's pretty much what I ended up with, I think. It's, um, that I don't know if you remember, in Jabba Crombie's, I think it's Best Served Cold, there's a scene where Shank the Assassin busts a fantasy opium den and beats up the local gangster and murders all his men. I thought, I want to write about that guy. Not the assassin, the drug dealer in a fantasy world running a shady tap. I just that it, it all sort of kind of went from there. You know? This is exactly what I want to do. It is my two favourite things in one glass. Why wouldn't I like this? <laughs> and I mean, a lot, I of, a lot of fun writing them. I think I read somewhere where, where you'd spoken about it and said that writing them was quite a bit of a challenge because it was a bit different to what you did <clears> before. Oh, completely, completely. I mean, I've, I've always loved what I call Swords and Horses fantasy, but I'd never actually written it before. Right. And obviously, I mean, the Drake books being set in basically modern day-ish London, there's only so much, I mean, I'm from London, there's only so much research I've got to do, you know. When you're making, I mean, it's a two-sided coin. You, you're making everything up. And, you know, the hard bit is you've got to make everything up. But the good bit is you can make everything up. You know what I mean? <laughs> Nobody's going to tell me actually there isn't a pub on that street corner in Peckham. You know, they'll go off, you know, like his fiction, dude. So doing it in a secondary world made that a lot easier in a, in a way, but a lot harder in another because obviously you, you've got to make it work. You've got to make it feel internally consistent, I think, even though the whole world is 
not real. It's got to feel real yeah. for people to engage with it, I think. So, yeah. But, yeah, no, it, was, it was very, very different, but a great deal of fun. The one thing I would say, though, if you ever plot out a trilogy and then decide to turn it into a quartet when you're a quarter of the way through writing book three, for the love of the gods, don't. <laughs> The, the plot, I mean, I, I had a conversation with my editor, my lovely Joe Fletcher at Joe Fletcher Books. It was like, look, this thing's going to be half a million words long if we do it as the third book of a trilogy. It's not going to work. She's like, no, you're right. Let's, it needs to be another two books. I'm like, Thank you very much. So we signed all the paperwork and everything. It's going to be another two books. And I looked at my outline and cut it in half at the halfway point and thought, well, like, shit now, isn't it? It just stops. <laughs> The amount of plot gymnastics that had to go into making Priest of Gallows work is as its own book. Right. Extraordinary. I, I really will endeavour never to do that again, to be perfectly honest with you. But it's been an in- interesting creative exercise. I mean, I'm midway through writing the final one now, and it's, mm. I've got it's all plotted out. It's all fine. It's come together. But, oh, God. I, I had a couple of months early last year. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did wonder because I saw it. Because I, I was, oh, it's a trilogy. And I was like, no, it's not. It's a four book series. And I checked. And I'm like, mm. no, it is four books. I was only thought. It is now. Yeah, it wasn't originally. <laughs> yeah, it is now. It's like, oh, shit. Yeah, it's quite, but there we are. We have made it well. I mean, Joe's a brilliant editor. We've made it work. You know, but there's a bit, a bit of a. Clench moments of the time, I must admit. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah, right there. So you, you you plan your books. You're not someone who just makes it up. Have you always planned your books? Uh, my Trump trilogy, I pretty much made up as I went along, which is probably why it's in the trunk. I think, <laughs> I've, done my like I've got to know where I'm going. I mean, I knew where the entire War for the Rose Throne sequence ended before I started writing the first one. And that was three books worth, there's now four books worth. I've always been going to the point it finishes and I've always known what that ending is. So I've got, I mean, the outline for Crowns is very quick to use, you can't read it. The outline for <laughs> Crowns is 15 odd pages long, I think. But it's, I, I tend to storyboard rather than plan every little detail. So I think if I knew every little detail, I must have the enthusiasm to write it because I'm a bit bored, to be honest. So I, I know where the, the beats are, the main plot events, and I kind of let the characters take me between them in their own way, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I do the same, because I figure if it's boring to write, it's going to be boring to read. Yeah, oh, exactly that. Yeah, absolutely. That's the last thing you want. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I sometimes wander off into the weeds, and when it comes to the edit, my editor will be like, "What's this?" And it, she'll <laughs> bring me back on course. But most of the time, <laughs> I have the exact opposite issue with ed- editors. Everything I've ever written, the Burman books, two different editors, Angry Robot, yeah, War for the Rose Throne with Joe and my former editor at Ace. Even the short stories I did for Warhammer, every single thing has got longer in edits, not shorter. Wow. I, honestly, I write so lean, it's ridiculous. I mean, I turn in 98, 105,000 words and it'll go print 130, I'll guarantee it, every time. I don't know, I, I think it's because I'm, I'm a very visual creative. I see it in my head as I'm writing it. And I fall into this awful trap of assuming that the reader can as well. And then I'll get edited notes like, where are we? What does this place look like? Who's he? I'll do that. Oh, fuck me, I didn't mention that. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it is easier to add than take away, I think, definitely. I, I've sometimes, I've sometimes I've occasionally from my daughter where she's said, is this character really important? I've gone, of course she is. And I've looked at the book and thought, actually, it's not there, but it's in my head why she's important. Mm-hmm. I'm about to go in and kind of... Yeah change it there's sometimes a, a, a gap i find but um it's because you spend so long with it in your head and you're playing around it for months and months and years and then when you commit it to paper you just assume it's all on the page and it's it's not <laughs> no no it's amazing how much you've just lodged in your subconscious because you've been staring at the thing for these like eight nine months a year however long it's been mm. but yeah you know what it looks like 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So why shouldn't they? They should be able to work it out for like half the text. Absolutely. That's there. Absolutely that. Do you have um, test readers or do you have anybody read your books before they go out? I, I don't anymore. I used to have on a couple of good friends that used to test read stuff for me, but I went out now. It goes to my agent, then it goes to my editor, then I do the edits, then it goes it goes to the harshest critic of all, my lovely wife, and then it goes back <laughs> to my editor. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Well, my wife, Diane, isn't a fantasy reader at all, but she's a big crime fan. So I work on a basis, if she likes it, it's all right. Because, you know, I want that crossover audience, obviously. I mean, crime audience is considerably bigger than the fantasy audience is. Right. So I think if you can get that crossover and, and appeal to the crime fans, then it's, it opens more doors than just going for pure fantasy readers. Yeah. Yeah. I hope. Anyway, that's that's the plan. That's the theory. <laughs> well, it's like the covers of your books are all very they're not overtly fantasy. They don't have, you know, there's no, I mean there's no dragons in your books, but they don't no. have like a dragon and a burning castle and all that kind of stuff. They're very um quite quite striking but simple images, you know. Mm, I love those covers. That they're, they've all been done by uh, American graphic designer called Katie Anderson and I think they are phenomenal you've got that architectural backgrounds and you know the, the special effects the weapon the blood splat whatever mm. they may overlay on it but I, I wanted that historical feel to it rather than a fantasy feel so yeah. you've got sort of Elizabethan and Georgian architecture on the covers with the I don't, I don't know if you've seen the cover of Gallows yet that's gone up but it's it's blue this time so we, we're doing a progression of of colours which are actually themed in line with the books and that's all quite playful. So this one's blue and you've got this wonderful Georgian background with this great big moose hanging in front of it. I think it's really striking. It's fantastic. So, so pleased with them. I, and I, I, can't, I can't show it you, but I have seen the cover for Priest of Crowns as well. And it is phenomenal. Really pleased with it. So did you have to do any research then in terms for the architecture? Because you've mentioned a couple of things there. I know it's fantastical, but if someone sort of says, what's this based on? Did you have to kind of go it's sort of a bit like that and then do some research yeah, on it? Yeah, so I, I did an interview. It's not come out yet, but I've got a print interview coming out in Blackgate in the not too distant future. And I got absolutely grilled in their never when column about the historical inaccuracies of fantasy. But it is all done deliberately because it's not historical fiction. It is yeah. fantasy. Yeah. And as I, I freely admitted in that interview, in Ellenburg, where Thomas is from, it's kind of the 16th century, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, dung and pigs and chickens kind of thing. Mm. And in Dansburg, the capital city, where, where he's a lot wealthier and he's hobnobbing with the nobility, it's the 18th century because I wanted that that class distinction. And I think, you know, if, if you sit your characters down to a royal Tudor banquet, it's still not going to sound very appealing because Tudor food looks weird to the modern eye. Sit them down to a Regency banquet and they'll be like, oh, well, something like that. Oh, sorry. Anyway. So that's the kind of thing I was going for, just period fluidity. But yeah, it kind of does kind of flip-flop between the two areas, depending which city you're in. But yeah, it's all, uh, it's all done on purpose. I, I think it works. I hope it does. I think <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, but that, that's the thing. People saying it's historic, fant uh, historic fiction. It's like, have they actually read the first book and met the character of <laughs> Billy? I mean... Exactly that. <laughs> yes. I mean, I've I've read the first two books. I could I don't spoil you anything, but there are there is low magic, I'd say, in your books. Oh, there's, there's definitely magic going on. There's probably a little bit more in uh, in Gallows than there was in the last two. Hmm. But uh, yeah, no, it's not supposed to be historical. I don't know. People talk about historical accuracy in a fantasy book. It's gonna be a bit of a headache. I quite understand that. I I think I I get what they mean is that it's got to make sense within yeah. the context of the world. You can't have some things unless you've got other things because the tech, one technology is dependent on another. So you've got to get that kind of thing right. Mm. But no, it's, you're not writing historical fiction. It's a completely different thing. If I wanted to be Bernard Cornwall, I'd be Bernard Cornwall and make 15 times as much money as I do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good idea. I'd love to be Bernard Cornwall. He's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, so, so speaking of that, obviously, because 
the Billy and some of the other characters like Kurt are based on the idea of cunning folk, which is a thing that's been around and you've kind of mm -hmm. taken it on to the next level with real, real magic. Did you have to kind of plan out the structure of the magic system? Nah. Nah. I don't, nah. <laughs> I don't, I don't like magic systems at all. I like Gandalf type magic, Baez right. magic. I, I don't like the kind of magic that is explained to the extent that you can predict what will happen because it's agent A mixed with reagent B, therefore yes. you'll, that's not magic, that's science, you know, which is fine. Chemistry. Yeah, I, I like the idea of the common people perceiving science to be magic. Mm. That's great. Yeah, I've got, I have a couple of books I've read and one I've recently written that have done that, where, you know, what the wizards do is actually chemistry, but it's so far beyond the understanding of the, the great unwashed that they think it's magic. Mm. But to have actual magic that is that explained doesn't does, uh, does float my boat at all. I like it to be wild and unpredictable and as dangerous for the magic user as it is for the person on the receiving end of it. You know? it's, but if it's supposed to be an unnatural force, which is you know, pretty much the definition of magic, yes. then I don't want to know how it works, personally speaking. Yeah, but there is a cost. They can't. They can't just fix all the problems. Of, like, oh, absolutely, oh, absolutely not. That's just cheating. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. There's got to be a cost and the chance of it going hideously wrong now and again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there's the yes, there, there, there's a cost to. I, I want to. I'm not spoiling anything. I'm being careful. But yeah, there's a cost to people who use the magic, and uh, mm. they can't just do it all the time. Every you know, every day, walk out and just wave their hands like you know. Uh, like Wanda in Wonder Vision, <laughs> <laughs> which I enjoyed, but you know, yeah, yeah there's, uh, no, there's no cost yeah. or anything. Um, so I, you, you've spoken about this in the past, but something I was going to mention um, a, again is about the realities of being, a, you know, a published author because some people have misconceptions about our lives now that we've bec now that we've made it, now that we've been traditionally <laughs> published, now that we're living. The big life. Living the dreams, Dave, obviously. <laughs> in our mansions. <laughs> were, were, you, were you actually surprised by anything once you became a traditionally published author? Or were you pretty, yeah, no, I, I guessed. I, I had done quite a lot of research. I've been on Absolute Right for years before I got published. So, yeah, I, I'd done the don't get your hopes up, don't quit your day job sort of level research. And obviously my, my first publishing deal was with a, independent publisher anyway so i wasn't expecting a great deal of money which is good because i didn't get it but i think that there is this perception that once you are published you've made it and i'm the, a pearl of wisdom i heard and i years ago and i can't for the life of me think who it was but an established author said the only thing harder than getting published is staying published and as i have discovered that is very very true you know, if you don't, you don't make the sales expectations, they're not going to publish your next book. You, you know, the lady in the supermarket isn't going to have heard of you. It's just authors, generally, if you're not George Martin, Neil Gaiman, Ian Rankin or whatever, you're probably not actually famous at all. You know? <laughs> you're really not. Nope. No, the only time no. you're going to be famous is when you go to a convention and you're surrounded by those fans. For 10 minutes, you feel like you're a celebrity. That's mm. it. That's, that's, you go that, back to lots, isn't it? And that, that's 10 minutes after your panel before they've forgotten you and moved on to the next person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The reality is you go home and it's take out the bin. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I read a thing from Stephen King. It must have been back in the 80s, I think, when he was absolutely joining it. In. I'm sure he still is. But even he said, you don't do writing for the money. If you get into it for the money, you're a monkey. And I think he's right. I mean, obviously, I've got a full-time day job, as most people have. And I treat writing as my my evening job. I would probably make more over a year stacking shelves at a supermarket as an evening job full-time than I do writing. I mean, I hate it. And I, you know, I, I don't do it for the money. I don't think any of us with half a brain do. It'd be nice. We'd all like the money one day, but it can't be your motivation for doing it. It's, it's got to be something you love. It really has. Yeah, yeah. because I, I didn't because... get... Um, so my debut didn't come out until I was 38. Mm. Um, 
So I, know. I, was, I think I was 42 when mine came out. See, there you go. Because some people yeah. get to like 25 and they go, oh, oh my life's over. I've not been public. Oh, no. I, 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 it makes me. Yeah. That's been doing the rounds on Twitter recently. They, you know, post it to be published or whatever it was. And I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> My friend of mine had a debut novel published when she was past 60. Why not? Uh -huh. Yeah. There's no expiration date on authors. No, no. I yeah. did it. Says I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Touch wood. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I was doing a talk recently for a university, and there again, I, I, I had a cat to spell it out and say, even if you have a first book and it's really, really good, it does really, really well, and you sell fifty thousand copies. Once that's gone out the door, the next thing your author, your agent, and your editor is going to ask you is, "So what's next?" Mm. It's being, well, being a writer is not one book; it's no, it's all, yeah. If you're lucky, if you're lucky, it's a career. You know? Yeah, it's a body but of work. Is, is to keep it going, isn't it? You know, and to maintain that publisher interest and obviously reader interest. Yeah, and so that when you finally shuffle off, there's a good body of work of with your name on it, you know. Absolutely, that. I, th I think about David Gamel, and he's got you know like forty plus books sat there with his name on. That's uh, oh, most of which are on my bookshelves, I think. Yeah. Yep, and mine. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> it's, it's not a bad legacy to have, you know. It's not, is it? No. But that's that's where he uh, that's where he was, you know, when. Yeah. He, he passed away a few years ago so so i'll ask because people want to know so your books war for the rose throne got optioned they did they have been optioned for television by a heyday which is marvelous they're a very very well regarded tv production company owned by david hayman who produced the harry potter movies and there's a, a lot of money behind them a lot of expertise and yeah i've been optioned for television which means Almost precisely nothing, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> well, what, what, it is, what a TV option means is they've paid me an amount of money to not sell a TV option to anybody else for a period of time. Right. Well, they may or may not do anything with it, basically. So the current position is they're looking for a writer for it. I hope they find a suitable writer for it. Obviously, I very, very much hope it gets made. But the statistics I saw were something like... 5% of things that get optioned and 1% of things that are optioned actually get made. So no, nobody's holding any breath, but you never know. You never know. It would be wonderful. I think a, a point in Wolf the Rose Throne's favour is because, as you say, it's more historical and not overly fantastical. Yes. It wouldn't need Game of Thrones money to do it, which I, I hope is a point in its favour, but we will see. I don't know. Very, very early days. Th These things take years to go anywhere. I think it is in its favour because if you look at something like Peaky Blinders, which people have compared, you know, your books mm. to, to some ways, yeah. there's, there's less CGI in there than there, there would be in, in yours as well, compared to one episode of Game of Thrones with, you know, dragons and walkers. Um, oh, exactly that. Yeah, it must cost eye-watering money to make those. Yeah, yeah, you know, how many, you know, dozens and dozens of people sat in a room working on computers for months to get a special effect for a minute or something mm -hmm. versus exactly. they can build a set and off they go and start filming for weeks. Yeah. So. Like you, you could probably film 90% of Priest of Bones in Edinburgh, to be honest, which is, is largely where it's, it's not set at all because Ellenburg sounds completely different to Edinburgh and isn't the same place where my wife's from that we nope. visit. Yeah, at all, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. No, no. Of course. Yeah. Inspiration, that is a beautiful place. I adore Edinburgh. My second, my second home. So that's kind of partly why the books are set there. Well, if, once COVID starts shifting again and things start opening up and they start filming again, who knows? They might... Uh... Who knows, yeah. Exactly that. I guess a lot of projects are just stalled because of... Um of covid and things and oh they must have done yeah all the filming and things no, i think the whole art set just pretty much on his knees at the minute isn't it? there's no live theater no no live music nothing so no difficult times but more um fantasy series have been optioned of late which is good and, and they've made a bit of a little splash mm. whether it's 
you know, Brian McClellan's Powder Mage books or, or you know, The Witch is obviously now in its second series filming and things like this. So I think the door is opening up for fantasy. Oh, it is. There's a lot of stuff getting optioned, definitely. I mean, I mean, Wheel of Time's in production at Amazon, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Under Lee's Jade City books have been optioned. Oh, wow, okay. I've not heard of that Which, one. Lawrence has got one of his series. I'm not sure which one. I'm sure he's got something under option at the moment as well. So hopefully they'll make one of them. If nothing else, give us something to watch, even if it isn't mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it used to be that fantasy was like a dirty word when you so, told people that you wrote fantasy. Oh, I know. Especially fantasy on TV. You used to think it's a Hercules or Legend of the Seeker or something. And they were all a little bit cheap and cheerful, weren't they? But then you know, I mean, Game of Thrones came along and the Lord of the Rings movies and they just threw the doors open for the genre. Really, really did. Yeah, yeah. You know, I am interested to see what Wheel of Time comes out looking like. Have you, you read them? Yeah, th- Sorry? Have you read them? Oh, I've read them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, big fan. I mean, Game of Thrones was this massive high production value movie quality spectacular, wasn't it? And then Shannara was Beverly Hills 9021 Elf, and it was a bit, oh, you know. <laughs> uh, where, 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 where on that spectrum is Will of Time going to land? I, mean, I really hope it's good. <laughs> I really do. My, my fear is that, you know, it's such a big thing. It's like 14 books or something. Oh, yeah, just 14 big, thick doorstop books. I, I don't know how they're going to do it. I really, I, I can't imagine they're even attempting to do the whole thing. On because you know, every time they renew a series after a while, you're like, Is it going to get a fourth season or a fifth? Um, season? Oh, that's lucky. Yeah, exactly. And the expanse is getting to six, and that's kind of a stretch, and that's already jumped one network. So, I mm. can't I can't see them doing 22 seasons to get all 14 books for Wheel of Time. It's just it's kind of ambitious, and I mean, to be, for all that I am a fan, there is a lot of Wheel of Time you could cut out and not miss, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. But even so, even so, you're still looking eight, nine seasons to do the whole thing. And it's just, really? It's I don't know. We live in hope. Yeah, we live in definitely. Hope. So I know something you'd written about as well is um, when people read your books, one thing that you really want is to, for it to have some kind of reaction, that the worst kind of response is just indifference or meh. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, you've got to... I think if you're any sort of creative, you've got to want to provoke a reaction, even if it's horror, disgust. I mean, you know, we'd prefer adoration and acclaim, but, you know, <laughs> if, if I make you think horrible things about me and wish ill on my family, at least I've made you feel something. Do you know what I mean? And I, that's, that's important to me. I mean, people just go, meh, that's all right. I think, oh, no, what did I do wrong? <laughs> So I, I, I don't know how you feel about it as an author, but I'm, to me, that's quite important that it, most people feel something and hopefully think about something. Yeah, I want them to have a reaction. I don't want mm-hmm. them to be to read it and go, yeah, it was all right. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's just... It's damning, isn't it? It's just, you, you obviously haven't engaged them at all if that's the reaction you get. Yeah. I mean, that's always, that's the author's fault. It's never the reader's fault. People react to, to words, how they react to them. If if you've not written it in a way that will make people provoke a reaction, then, you know, we've screwed up somewhere, haven't we? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Have you written stuff in this, in the, you know, War for the Rose Throne that you've been told, that's a little far and you've had to tone it down? A little bit, yeah, a couple of times. <laughs> I, I guessed. I was a guess. Yeah, there's a bit in Gallows. I'm without spoiling anything. Right. A little bit surprised. I got. I didn't get told to take it out. But I, I was like, my, my harshest critic, my good lady wife, was reading it after I'd done my um, structural edits. And the, the best feedback she has ever given me. She entered the room, clutching the manuscript, and just looked at me and said, "You horrible." horrible, horrible man and stalked into the kitchen. Oh, yes! <laughs> that was worth it. Brilliant. I was very pleased with that, yes. <laughs> I, I wondered, because there's some moments in the first two books that I've kind of read and gone, oh, 
that's that's really close to the bone. I'm thinking, I don't know how he got away with this with some of these. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I have very understanding editors. <laughs> So how has it been working with your editors? Have they kind of, well, you know, what, what's your process been like with them? Because obviously it's the same with me. It would go to my agent, it would go to my editor, and then I'd probably do quite a thorough edit once it's come back. But um, Yeah, I, I edit myself very thoroughly before it goes to them. So right. edits aren't normally too heavy. I say it is normally add more of this, add more of that, draw this out more. Yeah. Well, other than, than anything else, but it's it's kind of changed because the first two books we sold to Ace at Penguin Random House in the states for world rights, and then Joe Fletcher bought the UK rights as subsidiary rights. So my publishing deal in my own country was actually a foreign rights deal, which was kind of weird. But then publishing is, but um. Yeah, as, as I alluded to in that post I wrote, Ace aren't continuing the series in the States after book two, and Joe Fletcher Books have taken it up with worldwide distribution. Oh, wow. So I'm now, having previously been edited by my editor at Ace, I'm now exclusively being edited by Joe, which is great. Job. Joe's a fantastic editor. They, they don't let you hang your name above the door of an imprint unless you know what you're doing. You know yes. What I mean? yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, no, it's, it's been really, really good working with her. And I must say, Rebecca at Ace was amazing as well. I mean, she, Rebecca Brewer, she's freelance now. If anybody's looking for an editor, she's exceptionally good and highly recommended. But yeah, it's, it's, I, I enjoy it, actually. I like editing. I find drafting quite hard work, but I love editing. Right. Which I know, I know is the absolute arse about face of all this is supposed to say, but that's <laughs> just kind of how I, I think once it's, you got the thing, you can work on it and improve it and shape it and make it better. Yeah. When you haven't got the thing, you've just got to make the thing one way or another before you can you know, do anything constructive with it. So, no, I much prefer editing, editing to drafting, I really do. Mm. And, and copy edits is basically just accept all. I mean, honestly, I'm. <laughs> What, what even is grammar? That's what copy editors are there for. I have no idea. You know, don't worry about that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think that first draft can be quite difficult. And I know some people, when they're writing, they get caught in a loop when they're trying to make it perfect. And my, you know, they do like 20 or 30,000 words and they go back and edit it. And edit. my response mm. is, don't, because it, you're going to revise this book so many times anyway, you'll be sick of it. So I'd get to the oh, end. Exactly and finish right. it. Yeah. Well, I always work on a basis of that's how I know it's time to send it, is what I'm utterly and totally sick of the sight of the thing. I've probably done enough editing on it, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I described it as when I've got to the point that all I'm doing is moving the chairs around on the Titanic, it's just, mm. got, to it's just got to go. Nothing's making a difference at this point. It's you know? done now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's going, it's going. So, so did you set out to write Grimdark? Because... I don't think they're grimdark, which is a weird thing because that's a whole what's grimdark. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. What is grimdark? It's the thing that if you ask ten authors what is grimdark, you'll get ten different answers. Nobody agrees. It doesn't really mean anything. I I think they're low dark fantasy. Yeah, they're not. I mean, grimdark, as I'm sure you know, comes from Warhammer Forty Thousand, where the whole point of it is the utter futility of absolutely everything. And yeah. whatever you do, or however many million men die on Mars, you're all going to get eaten by Tyranids eventually anyway. You might as well just eat a bolter and save yourself the misery. That's grimdark. And, I mean, War Warhammer's satire. And I wish more people realised that. But Warhammer is satire. And I think if a fantasy novel was really grimdark to the extent that you knew there was no point to anything... It wouldn't be a lot of fun. You wouldn't really want to read it. No. So, no, I, mean, I don't think many things that are billed as grimdark actually are. I think it's it's a combination of probably there's not very much magic in it. And sometimes nasty things happen. But, I mean, you look at Joe Abercrombie, Lord Grimdark himself. <laughs> His books are hilarious. They are laugh out loud funny in no end of play. I mean, you're, you're often laughing out loud at something you probably really shouldn't be, but they're just funny. You know, he, he gets 
the absurd within the horrific. And I, I think that's probably part of it. I'm a really big admirer of his stuff. Absolutely great. But yeah, true nihilistic, there's no point. No, no, that's not what they are at all. Yeah, Glockter makes me laugh a lot in his... Oh, he's hilarious. Oh, you read the new ones, the Time of Madness books? I've read the first one so far, oh, and the right. Hatred. So I've not read the yeah, yeah. second one? There, yeah, the, sec oh, the second one's fantastic. Um, <laughs> really, really enjoying that. I won't, I won't say anything because I don't want to spoil it. But okay. There's, a, there's a, a conceit he uses in that that he's so funny. <laughs> Whilst you know, tormenting and torturing his characters as Joe does, but it is so funny. Uh, yes, he does seem to have great glee in that. And I think what I liked about Glockter right at the beginning was he's so just desperate to die and he's really willing anybody to do it, and they always disappoint him. And yet he's asking them to kill him. And it's just like, I've never seen that in a character before. The first time I read it, I just thought, this is hilarious. He's desperate yeah. to die. And everyone's so rubbish, he can't tolerate them um they really are excellent stuff so you're working on book four now i am and that'll be coming out next year as far as i know yeah i mean <clears throat> i don't think anybody really knows what the pandemic's done to publishing schedules at the minute but yeah book three priest of gallows is out on april the 29th this year that's that's set in stone now the pre-orders are in and all the rest of it Book four, as far as I know, will be out next year, but quite when next year, I don't know, as yet. Yeah. And that will be called Priest of Crowns, and that really is the end of it. I'm not splitting it again. <laughs> no, promise, no, no, I promise. <laughs> no, definitely not, definitely not. Definitely not. No, that really is it. This is not going to be one of these, the series that didn't know when to die sort of thing. It's, it has a defined end, and it will be at the end of book four. I think that's... That's good. When you know, so do you know what you're going to do next? I mean, do you constantly have ideas bubbling along whilst you're working on things? Yeah, I've got ideas. I've got about 10k probably drafted of something else that might go somewhere, might not, or I might do something completely different. I, oh, it depends, really. I'm very easily distracted, shall we say. So I'm trying <laughs> to think about it because I have got a deadline for Priest of Crowns that I would quite like to hit if it's possible. And if, if I start tinkering with ideas for the next thing, then I'll, I know what will happen. You know, I'll have written the next thing, be six months behind with the current thing that I've actually had a contract for, and that doesn't make authors very popular. Ooh, so, no. no, no. Trying to make sure that doesn't happen at all costs. But yeah, I, it'll probably be another fantasy. It might be a bit lighter in tone, I think. Right. I don't right. know. I think after the last year, two years, or however long this is going to bloody drag on for, mm. people might have probably had about enough of misery by the end of this year. Don't know. I mean, you can't, you can never predict trends or try and write to the market, but no. it, it feels, I, I feel like I've had enough of misery and would quite like to write something a bit more fun, I must admit. But we'll see. I mean, I'm a naturally miserable bugger, so <laughs> I decide to, to start torturing people, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. See, see what what mood you're in once you've finished Crowns. Hell, exactly that. Yeah. What you're going to do next and stuff. Do you, are you do you write write a bit and then pitch the ideas to your agent and or, or editor or? Um, I haven't done until now. So when I was a lovely robot, I didn't have an, an agent. I got in with them through a, their open door submissions period. All oh, right. Wow. Okay. 2013, 14, I don't which year it was. And they bought Drake, and then they bought the other two, and that was lovely. And then they went pretty much bust and changed hands and decided they didn't want any more of them, which is a bit of a shame, but such is life. Mm. But I was writing, oh, I've been writing Priest of Bones long before that happened anyway. And I wrote all of that and pitched it to agents and signed with Jenny Golliboy, who's who was at a boutique agency. She's now at DMLA with Donald Miles, which is marvellous. So she sold that to Ace in a two-book world rights, and then she sold the next, you know, the other two to Joe Fletcher when Joe took over the global distribution from being sub rights. So I've not been in that position yet. I was, it's a conversation I'm going to have to have with Jenny. Is mm. I, I don't I don't know at what point you get to sell on spec. 
really. Well, I don't know. I know more established people do. They pitch a synopsis that your agent shops, and because you're really famous, somebody buys it. But I'm not convinced I'm that famous yet. I, d- I don't honestly really know how that works. So I'm going to have to uh, so I, have that conversation. I, I'm anticipating having to write the next whole thing and take it out on sort of thing. Yeah, like you, I'm not in a position where I can go, I'm going to write something about pirates. Oh, yes, we'll take that for three book deals. Oh, it be marvellous, yes. <laughs> Here's a contract, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that happens to some people, but I don't think it happens to us, so let's be honest. No, no. no. Oh, well. I'm sure RJ said he wrote some kind of poem for Bone Ships, and they said, yeah, all right. <laughs> but RJ is his own entity, and he's his oh, own... Isn't he just, yeah, bless him. He's his own thing. Oh, I know. Lovely guy. Yeah, <laughs> Bone Ships is... I'm really, really enjoying the Bone Ships books. They are so cool. I've read the yeah. first one. Uh, oh, well, you need to get on the second one. It's even better. I've, I've spotted some of the uh, cameos of friends in the first. <laughs> um, yes, I, I can't believe he got away with some of that. Honestly, <laughs> he's promised me that I'm apparently in the third one, but I said, "Do I die on screen?" But he won't tell me if I die on screen in the third one. So I have to wait and see now when I get to it. Well, I'm an island that gets blown up in the second one, so I mean... <laughs> uh, right. could could end up dead. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, it was Nelsa that got me. I was like, my, how did you get away with that? <laughs> really? Yeah, some people just be like, who? <clears throat> yeah, we, <clears throat> we know. <laughs> it's one of those, if you know, you know cameo, isn't it? <clears throat> oh, excuse me. It's not yeah, a huge yeah. stretch to look at the people at Orbit Books and oh, uh, yeah. look at RJ and think, oh, who does he interact with? It's uh, <laughs> as a similar name. We'll leave it out yeah. there for people who don't know. But um, uh, <laughs> So what have you read lately that's been really good? Anything that uh, you've... What have I read lately? I'm, I'm a bit off fantasy at the minute because I find I struggle to read in the genre when I'm writing in it because... Mm. Yeah, you know, you, you, you're aware of the danger of getting sort of voice bleed over and idea bleed over. So I, I read a lot of crime, obviously, but last thing I, anyway, last thing I read that wasn't a reread anyway, was uh, a historical crime novel called Daughters of Night by Laura Shepard Robinson that came out recently. Right. She's set, set in Regency London. It's really, really good. I enjoyed her. Uh, first one was called Blood and Sugar. It came out year before last, which is sort of focused on the slave trade and murders and things. And uh, this one is superb. They're very... They read almost like a grimdark fantasy, but there isn't any magic in it. Because 17th century London, unless you were really, really rich, was a horrible place. <laughs> a really extremely filthy, disease-ridden and pox ridden and beggars and prostitutes on every street corner kind of thing and they are so so well written i highly recommend them if you want a bit of historical crime under your fingernails they're great i mean right at the minute, because everything is so absolutely bloody awful at the minute i've been doing comfort rereads of the old dinah win jones books right working my way through the crest of Mansi books at the minute. And I don't care that they're for 10 year olds because I loved them when I was 10. So I can see why I can't love them now. <laughs> Enjoying that hugely. Yes, this is a nice wind down at the end of the day before you go to bed kind of thing. Yeah. I, I saw a couple of tweets where you said you'd gone down like the local supermarket and pulled a crime book or something off it. Oh, I've, yes. Oh. I've had very mixed results with that. <laughs> I, I just, I'll tell you what, that's how I discovered Karen Slaughter. Right. Who I, I know she's enormous. Well, I know now she's enormously famous. I've honestly never heard of her. And I've pulled um, a book called Pieces of Her that's coming to Netflix next year, I think. It's excellent. Really enjoyed that. And then I, I got an alleged documentary memoir by Anonymous yeah. called I Am a Hitman. And I got to the end of the first chapter. I was like, no, mate, no, you are fucking <laughs> not. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, just who do you think you're kidding, pal? You know what I mean? So, yeah, mixed results. There were no points in between. But um, what else have I read recently? Sarah Pimper is dead to her. Enjoyed that a lot. Right, okay. She's coming, 
coming to TV called Savannah, I think it's set in Savannah, Georgia, amongst rich and unpleasant people being unpleasant to each other in a very dynasty kind of way. I greatly enjoyed that. <laughs> I never read anything by Sarah that I haven't liked, to be honest. She's very, very versatile, does all sorts of things. I've read some of her uh, early, they're not quite horror, but they're sort of horror um, crime ones. I think I read some of her mm. early ones and, and those are really interesting. Yeah. Um, no, all of her stuff's very, very good. Mm, Behind Her Eyes was another yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, well, that's just been on TV as well. Yeah, wasn't there that? you go. Yeah, that was the first big one that went to TV. So she's obviously done. Mm. I think she said, I was an overnight success, and that was her 12th book or something. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, this is, this is the general perception, isn't it? I mean, until you're on TV, the average person's not going to have heard of you, are they? And then suddenly you have this new big name, and you're like, I've been doing this for a decade. <laughs> Overnight success, 10 years in the making. That's the one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well, that'll God. be you when, uh, you know, Priest of Bones comes to <clears> TV. <throat> Evan will be like, has he written anything before? <laughs> and you're like, yes. Look yes. At all these books that I've written. <laughs> oh, God. It drives me potty. Oh, it drives yeah. me potty. Why, why the world? And, uh, there we are. <laughs> yeah. The realities of being an author versus the... Uh, the illusions that people have. Oh, well, I mean, you, you look at the way authors are portrayed on TV. They're always li either living in this big Manhattan loft apartment or some wonderful, great converted windmill in the Cheshire countryside or something. Like, really? <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, what's that? There's an American crime TV. Castle, what's that? Yeah. I mean, have you he never even writes anything. He's too busy solving murders. and he's got the, Whacking great apartment. Really, mate. He sat playing poker with like Michael Connolly and, mm -hmm. and all these other ones, and I'm like, yeah, they they can they can do that, but you know, <laughs> but this guy, mm, nah, I'm not buying probably, it. Probably not, nah, nah. God, I love it. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, thanks, thanks for coming on tonight. Thanks for for talking to us, and uh, and look forward to Priest of Gallows, which comes out very very soon in April. I can't wait for that. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. It's been nice to have a chat. Well, it's good to see you again. <laughs> good night, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.